Welcome to this lecture on energy management, energy trading portfolio and risk management. Today we will start covering risk management. We will discuss types of risks in this video and we will discuss credit risk management as one specific risk associated to energy trading. So let's start with the types of risks. Here we have a diagram where we have the extent of damage on the horizontal axis and the probability of occurrence on the vertical axis. And we are looking for risks relevant to activities in the energy sector, in particular relevant to energy trading portfolio and portfolio management comprising all the components we have discussed so far. So please take a moment and think about what risks you perceive are present in energy trading. We have already discussed at least two. One is price risk. This was already at the heart of our portfolio management strategies. How much price risk you take and how much profit contribution you expect from taking that risk. So that's one risk. And I also mentioned at some point counterparty or credit risk. So the risk that your counterparty defaults. One advantage of futures trading was that the power exchange or the energy exchange, which in that case is your counterparty, has a very, very low default risk. While when trading forwards, the platform, the broker platform, just connects supply and demand without taking its own stake. So there you directly do the deal with the counterparty, which is another energy trading party. And there is typically, hopefully, a very, very small, but still non-negligible risk of default involved. So these two risks we have already discussed. Maybe you can come up with more. Of course, we have collected a few. Starting in the very upper right with the price risk we already discussed. Then we have volume risks, that volumes are not what the party engaging in the trade thought they would be. Number three on the very left with low probability of occurrence and low extent of damage, we have liquidity shortage risk. Number four, a little bit more likely and a little bit more dangerous, is product liquidity risk. So two types of liquidities here we will differentiate in a second. Then we have probability of occurrence somewhat higher, legal risks, number five. We have system risk, number six. We will again discuss this in a minute. And then we have administrative risks, which imply that some of the people acting, the stuff working at the company, is doing something wrong. And last but not least, we have credit risk number eight and storage and transport failure risk, uh, which we will not discuss in great detail. That's specific, for example, to uh, operating storage infrastructure that you cannot access it. So this is a first assessment, not only looking at risks, but also analyzing their probability of occurrence and the extent of damage that may be involved with these specific risks. Let's go through them from one price risk to eight credit risk. Price risk. When and how does it occur? Well, it happens when price changes affect the open position that is price risk. Price changes, you have an open position, value of that open position changes, and if that goes bad, then it's a risk. 
This price risk is influenced by the size of the open position. That's one thing. The larger the open position is, of course, the higher your leverage is regarding, with regard to any given price change. So one euro change in the forward price, depending on how big your open position is, leads to a different manifestation in loss or profit. The other component, of course, is the forward or future price change. So the probability that prices change and the intensity of the associated changes. So one is how much open position do we have, the higher it is, the more already a moderate price change will affect the value of the position. And then we have the price changes themselves, the more volatility there is, the more likely they are to change, um, the more, of course, again, your open position in euros is going to be affected. Factors to describe price changes, we can discuss volatility, for example, daily volatility measured as standard deviation of price changes or of logarithms of price changes and the maximum expected or maximum occurred price change. We will also come back to price changes in the next video. This is, of course, one or maybe even the fundamental risk in energy trading. Number two, volume risk. Occurrence, a deviation between expected and realized supply volumes and or demand volume volumes. For example, power plant outages. So the volume risk is typically you expect it to get something delivered or produced or to have a client who would take this or that much energy and then that does not happen for whatever reason. For example, simply you sold the production of a power plant, but the power plant breaks down. Unplanned outage, nothing to do about it. You sold the electricity, but your plant cannot produce it. Other forms this volume risk is influenced by generation outages we already mentioned. Second is change of customer base. We mentioned that household customers have the right to change their supplier so they may sign on with you during the year or they may leave you during the year and change to another supplier and you may have already bought the energy or you have not yet bought the energy for new clients so this is a volume risk you do not really know how many household customers you will deliver next year second is consumer behavior this depends on the type of contract you sign if you have an open contract, so to say, where you specify that, for example, to an industrial consumer, you deliver whatever they need, or at least within certain threshold values, then you don't know in advance how much they're actually going to produce and thus consume from your perspective. So if it's an industrial company, if for whatever reason they have some internal holidays or some maintenance or whatsoever and they consume less and you have that volume risk taken with your contract, then you have excess electricity or energy, may also be gas, you have to sell somewhere else. Or if they have a very, very good, their goods are in very good demand, they produce more of the goods and thus consume more energy and if you agreed to an open delivery contract where you took their volume risk then again you may have to deliver more than you bought and planned and you have a certain volume risk so that's a second dimension of volume risk and then there is forecasted versus actual demand and generation on relatively short notice if consumption profits for example deviate um, because you um, because, for example, well, the weather changed, something like that. Or if on the supply side you have stochastic photovoltaic or wind feed-in. So this is may 
overlap with generation outages, but here it's somewhat different because even if your wind turbine is perfectly fine and operational, it may still produce less than you expected due to a too optimistic wind forecast. So if you forecasted more wind than actually have bloat during any given specific time, then production is less and you have a deviation from what you expected. And if you took again that volume risk, somebody is facing that volume risk, it's ending up somewhere um, and that person has this risk at this point. So that's volume risks. Number three, liquidity shortage risk, also referred to as cash flow risk. Occurrence, poorly coordinated payment flows, deadlines lead to insufficient liquid funds. In short, your company runs out of money. So you have to pay somebody, but you can't because you don't have the money right now. You may still be solid in your overall portfolio. You may get some money later on, but that's not really helping you. If, for example, you sold a forward, which will be paid next year, that's not helping you with today's bill. So this is generally the company is still healthy, but due to poorly coordinated payment flows, it still runs out of money. How can this be avoided or this is neutrally formulated, influenced by the design of contracts. In a way you can specify payment dates. The exchange business partners requirements for cash and collateral. So you can specify in contracts that you need collateral from your business partners if certain things happen. And then the contractual composition of the portfolio in what type of trades you engage, what products and what payment schemes you engage. And then you can also, of course, talk to your bank and negotiate in advance a certain credit line, for example. And if your operation is fundamentally safe and sound, banks are likely to agree to this. Definition of liquidity shortage risk, risk that liquidity will not suffice to meet payment obligations. That's liquidity shortage risk, in short. Then the other liquidity risk is product liquidity risk. That's completely different, even though it's also liquidity here, it's the liquidity of the product. And remember, we have already talked intensively about this. We have already said that you can measure liquidity on markets. Typically, a low bid ask spread is one sign of a high liquidity, but also the order book depth is a sign of liquidity. And here, product liquidity is exactly the risk associated to a low liquidity of a product. So the occurrence insufficient or too low trading volumes and bids and offers of products. This means positions cannot be closed or opened without huge discounts. So for example, imagine a very bad scenario where you own something, you are long and the price drops and you have a stop loss limit in place to at least stop your losses at some point but you see the price declining and you want to act you see my stop loss has passed i want to sell get out of the position but you don't find a counterparty they're saying, well, we're not taking it, too risky. Or they're saying, well, let's wait. Or they're saying, I take it, but you know, at a price down here. And then you say, well, I'm not willing to take that huge discount and you wait. And in worst case, prices tumble even more and more and more. And at some point you have, even though you had a stop loss limit in place, and even though you wanted to act, you couldn't act and you lose a lot of money. 
That's when we refer to the option trading exactly this product liquidity risk was what manifested for long-term capital management. You remember the company founded by the Nobel Prize winners on the option price theory. Okay, this product liquidity risk is influenced by the composition of the portfolio and the open position. For example, when you focus on forward trading on the most liquid time periods and products, we already said the frontier is typically very liquid. Frontier plus one is also still, also year plus two is also relatively liquid, but after that it becomes illiquid. So if you, for example, already trade guess futures or forwards 10 years in the future, you may find a counterparty willing to sell it or buy it. But as you said, it's going to be mostly OTC over the counter trading and it's not a very liquid market. So if you engage in such trading, you should be well aware that it may be hard to get out of that deal if you have to on short notice. So depending what you buy, in particular how liquid it is and how far in the future it is, um, the more liquid, the higher the chances that you avoid the product or at least keep the product liquidity risk low. Similar to typical share trading, if you trade blue stocks, like very established large shares in Germany traded or included in the DAX 30 uh, in other countries in the main indices. Well, then you can assume that it's going to be relatively liquid. While if you trade some obscure second, third, fourth tire company, nobody has ever heard of, even if it's exchange listed, well, it may have, or it certainly has a higher product liquidity risk. Doesn't mean that you don't have any if you, even if you um, trade blue stocks, blue chip companies, but still the risk is certainly smaller than with some smaller companies. Okay, so here it's to choose your portfolio and the traded products, right? It's also influenced by general market conditions. So there is periods where there is more or less risk in the market, which even can be measured and estimated to a certain degree in advance. Of course, you can't always foresee crashes. It's kind of the nature of a crash that it happens suddenly and without too many people expecting it, because otherwise prices already would have gradually declined because people were trading on their expectation. So the nature of a crash is that it happens very, very fast and that it may have liquidity risk associated, but still certain market conditions may favor or not favor liquidity risks. Product liquidity risk, that is. Okay, again, the definition of product liquidity risk, the risk that a product will become illiquid. That means that trades in this product can be done A, not at all, B, only to a limited extent, or C, only through deteriorating conditions you are unlikely to accept. You find the discounts offered uh, on the bid or offer site so tremendous and even outrageous that you have a very hard time agreeing to it. This is product liquidity risk. Legal risk, occurrence, poorly formulated contracts lead to unforeseeable or non-fulfillable obligations, claims towards or from third parties. Typically, it's you have signed a contract believing it specifies a deal you would like to stick to. However, your counterparty had a different understanding of the contract, what it implies. And then at some point they tell you, look, we interpret this contract differently from you. We, for example, believe we can get out of it if it's unfavorable. And then 
you may face legal risk. I personally have participated in several arbitration cases because in the energy sector generally you typically have very long-term contracts which are valid for 10 or even 20 or 30 years. If for example a party um, offers to invest in a power plant and the second party is interested to participate financially with a signed contract. There is often discussions on those contracts because market environments change. For example, quite often, historically, power plant financial contracts had the right to nominate day ahead production schedules. So you had a virtual slice bought in a power plant, say 100 megawatt, and you were allowed to nominate those 100 megawatts with a clean spark spread option for example so you had costs and you had revenues and you could specify when and how much you want to produce that's what your contract told you and that's what was the idea at the time the contract was signed however now the markets developed and balancing power became an important revenue source but your contract was signed at a time when nobody talked about balancing power. So what's now happening? Do you implicitly, through your 100 megawatt virtual slice, have the right to contribute from additional revenues from that slice? That's of course what the person signing or the company signing that contract would argue. It was change in market environments, unforeseeable, and so on, and so on, and so on. And we have our 100 megawatts, we have the right to participate and also offer buy and sell balancing power. You can imagine the power plant operator who sold the financial contract says, no, that's not our understanding. We sold you exactly what's specified in the contract. You can nominate production day ahead. If there is any balancing power revenues, they are, of course, with us. We fulfill your contract by the letter, and that's what we agreed upon. So, not an easy discussion. There have been arbitration cases on this. And then, of course, you have to look at the contract, what the clauses are, and how it can be interpreted, and stuff like that. So, there is legal risks associated to these energy contracts. The risk is influenced by contract design, how well you specify what's traded in the contract, changes in the environment and the market as I just described, but also in legislation, scope of interpretation of the courts. Of course, then if you have an arbitration, for example, then it totally depends what the course decides. Okay, so the definition of legal risk, the risk that a contract or a group of contracts does not contain the desired legal content. System risk is next. Occurrence mal malfunction of processes, systems and or procedures. For example, your software has a problem. For example, your hardware breaks down. We already said it's of the utmost importance that you nominate your day ahead production and consumption schedule on the day ahead power exchange to be able to report a balanced portfolio group or balanced balancing group uh, at 2.30 to your TSO. Now imagine you have a power failure on your trading floor around noon, shortly before noon, and you haven't submitted what you want to buy or sell yet, and you are unable due to hardware failure, power outages, your hardware doesn't work. And when I was trading, we had battery powered notebooks for these emergencies. So this is a realistic scenario you have to be prepared for. And that is system risk. So it's influenced by organization. You can, of course, minimize such system risk uh, by software, how you check your code, whether you use 
uh, for example, self-made software. On the one hand, you have full control. On the other hand, it may not be as well tested as professional software you buy, which is in place at hundreds of other companies as well. And then hardware, as I just mentioned, depends on do you have battery powered laptop as backup and so on. Definition of system risk, risk from malfunctions within the processes, systems and procedures. Administrative risk, on the other hand, is errors or omissions of the acting people. That's when humans make mistakes within your company, within your responsibility. Of course, there is a saying, wherever work is done, errors, mistakes will happen. It's natural and unavoidable. And to a certain degree, we totally accept it. For example, when we write papers, of course, we are doing our very, very best to avoid grammar and spelling mistakes, starting with using word spell check, ending with professional proofreading services for the non-native speakers. But still, you cannot guarantee that there was some small grammar mistake somewhere in the paper. Sometimes I even spot some in published books, even if you have a very, very professional lecture, lecturate um, and spell checking, you still encounter some spell, spell errors, spelling errors, or in newspapers, of course. So if it happens too often, it gets embarrassing, both for papers and for newspapers and so on. So if you encounter a spell error on every page of a newspaper, it's kind of a sign for bad quality of the newspaper, I would say. But if very, very occasionally there is an error, it's probably unavoidable. So this is the scenario we are dealing with. On the one hand, wherever people work, mistakes can happen. On the other hand, you want to avoid or minimize them. And last but not least, depending on how important the sector and the specific task is, uh, the effort to minimize errors has to be. For example, in the airline industry, both in manufacturing and in maintenance and overhaul, errors should be absolutely minimized because the consequences put are potentially disastrous. Planes may crash. And that's why these industries, hospitals, are somewhat similar, uh, have very rigorous procedures in place to minimize human error. So they still say errors can happen. They don't say, look, stuff, please don't make any errors. That would be absurd, completely unrealistic and not working. What they do is let people work, but check and double check. And if necessary, check again. And then you can give people checklists. That's what you see when you take a plane somewhere. People, you, you sometimes see people standing outside the plane checking something and even ticking boxes. This is keeping administrative risk at bay. But again, it has to be in proportion to what the current occasion is. Um, Okay, so this is influenced by the employees and the training level and the motivation of the employees. But this is also influenced by the organization, documentation and communication, I just mentioned. And also control, check and double check if it's really of the utmost importance. Definition of administrative risk, risk of incorrect information or making incorrect decisions or performing, performing incorrect activities as a result of human error or non-compliance with processes and rules. This sometimes happens. And this is administrative risk. And then we would like to briefly discuss 
credit risk and then go to go into a detailed discussion of credit risk management. So credit risk, the occurrence, counterparty default. Somebody owes you money, but that somebody is not paying it. That's a manifestation of credit risk. This is influenced by the credit rating of counterparties, because typically, apart from legal risk, if you have a binding contract, you do get your money via court in the worst case. So it's not like you have a binding contract, company is not delivering here in terms of counterparty default risk, uh, and then you go to court and force them to pay. Here it's the counterparty defaults and says, yes, in a way we recognize we have an obligation to pay you, but we can't. We are bankrupt. That's the point, the main point here regarding credit risk. And that's why it's influenced by the credit rating of the counterparty. So you can assess the likelihood that your counterparty becomes bankrupt. And that influences the credit risk, the counterparty risk. Then you can discuss financial volumes per counterparty. So not, I think the English saying is not putting all eggs in one basket. Trading with several counterparties. So if one of them defaults, yes, it's bad, but it's not a disaster for your company. At least it doesn't trigger a chain reaction that then you bankrupt yourself, which sometimes has happened. I personally am aware of a trading company that was set up to deal in the Belgium, Netherlands area, and they had a large client who went bankrupt, could not pay their bills toward that company, and the loss of that company was so huge that the parent, the mother company, decided against backing that up, and that company then also slid into bankruptcy even though it was generally perceived as being healthy. It was just this one-time shock which was beyond the ability of that company to pay. Then there is netting agreements. I will also already explain these at this point. A netting agreement is if you repeatedly trade with a company, always the same counterparty, if you sell to them, and then also buy from them. The netting agreement says we only owe each other the difference. But if you don't have a netting agreement, then if your counterparty defaults, then the person in charge of insolvency trying to make the best out of the mess has the right to fulfill all the good contracts in a way. So if you owe that company money, they will tell you, please pay it. We have a legal, you have a legal obligation, you have a binding contract. You owe us, even though we are bankrupt, you owe us money, you have to pay us so that at least we can pay as many of our debtors as possible, which does make sense, of course. But then you say, well, yes, but you also owe me money. And then they say, yes, but as you know and are aware of, we can't pay at the moment, so please get in line. We will see what remains when we come down to your claim. So that's what happens without netting agreements. And that's why I do advise to sign netting agreements. Then it's only about the difference. Then there is forward versus futures. Please take a second, stop the video, and think about what the point regarding forwards and futures in terms of credit risk was. And I am not repeating this, it's on some of our early slides, forwards versus futures, and I even said it in the very beginning of this video, so please answer this one yourself, why credit risk is influenced by forwards and futures. Last but not least, margin calls and collateral. So if you're working with counterparties where you agree on collateral, then of course 
credit risk is not so severe because if that's for example what banks are doing with you if you want to get credit or a loan to build or buy a house or a flat or whatsoever the bank may want collateral and if you default you say well i can't pay uh, my loans anymore my rates anymore then the bank says well that's sad for you so we keep your collateral whatever that is like maybe another house your parents may have helped with that uh, or something else or the house itself may go over to the bank okay so that's collateral and that's the end of the chapter on the different types of risks